I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts. Have you been on the beds? Uh, well, I haven't been on the beds. Um, and for the, the vast majority of people who listen to the podcast, Nicola is referring to slightly orange tint to the camera in the studio here, which has given me a bit of a... Slightly. You look <coughs> totally tangled. You look as if you've had a run-in with a fake tan Kalashnikov. Like the other Donald. Like the other Donald. The other Donald. Your name's the, the <laughs> <laughs> Who, of course, is... Uh, appearing in one of the great mugshots of all time, is yeah. it not today? Which is amazing. Yeah, yeah. He just looks like a bold child. He does, and yeah, yeah I do remember my kids pulling that face at me when they were yeah. not young, you know? He's mm. so unattractive, Donald Trump. I mean, he is so unattractive. <laughs> is that woman still with him? What, what attracted her to the billionaire Donald Ugh. Trump? I mean, but, no money. Now, but what a great segue into the Kinnans. Nicola, because <laughs> what? <laughs> because will someday it looks this week it emerges we may yet see Daniel Kinnan appearing in a similar mugshot at some time. Oh, in that's the a good one. I thought you were going to say he'd be tanned on no. his way back from Dubai. No, which is possible as well. It is possible. Um, yeah, I mean we probably are going to see. So, anyway. The reason for us talking about the Kinnahans today is for something that we've known about this yep. for some time. And we were under the impression that it was important not to break this. Yeah. Uh, the fact that there was a file being prepared and was sent to the Director of Public Prosecutions in relation to the three Kinnahans. I have alluded to the fact that I believed that Daniel Kinnahan would be on his way back to Ireland, that we didn't know where the other two were going. Um, but of course, the good and the great uh, commissioner of Angarda Shikona, Drew Harris, amidst some turmoil he's having maybe in his working life, uh, has announced this week that the file is with the DPP. So to explain to people what that means, it means that we want to put Daniel Kinahan, his father Christopher and his brother Christopher Jr. in the dock in Ireland in the Special Criminal Court. They'll more than likely go on trial together if those uh, charges are accepted by the Director of Public Prosecution. My understanding is that all three are wanted for directing a criminal organisation. Uh, you have a little bit of detail about that and the maximum tariff on that is 40 years, is that right? No, I think the maximum is up to life imprisonment. Right. Um, like, it's not a charge that has been brought regularly in this state. It was brought in in 2009 to combat organised crime specifically, um, but it's under uh, Section 71A. Uh, it's called Directing the Activities of a Criminal Organisation. Um, so what what it means is uh, that it's, it's, it's legislation brought in for and it specifically says to to people who direct the activities of a criminal organization but who may not participate in the commission of the offenses mm -hmm. so really the classic uh, explanation for that would be somebody who orders a hit but doesn't carry it out yeah doesn't touch a gun doesn't drive a car isn't part of the cleanup scene so that 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 is it and how is it proven i suppose it is proven by so the section provide. this is what the technical explanation yeah. is. It says the section provides that any statement or conduct of an accused causing a reasonable inference that that person was directing the activities of criminal organization shall be admissible as evidence. So that is, um, I suppose, would focus on, one would imagine, we don't know with, with, with the, the Kinnans in particular, but we'd imagine that would be stuff like electronic communications. Obviously, if there was a witness which... You know, we've never heard anything of that who who would say he told me this or he told me that. That would also be admissible. Um, and it also makes provision, the act, for inferences that may be drawn from documentary evidence. So that, again, is probably talking about, um, you know, uh, other pieces of, of some of that digital communications, really, I mm -hmm. would think. And the offences carry a penalty of up to life imprisonment. 
And of course, um, in the case of Daniel Kinahan in particular, uh, there's a possibility there would be a murder charge. There's That has been considered. That has been considered. Um, that has been considered, but it, it also would be, you know, if there was evidence of electronic communication surrounding a murder or an attempted murder, that could also feed into directing a criminal gang. It yeah. wouldn't have to be a sole murder charge. So, for example, if you saw the Regency where the state really went for Jerry Hutch to be tried for murder, he wasn't tried for some of the other things that may have been surrounding the Regency Hotel, which mm. would have been under this sort of legislation. Um, so, you know, we don't know the, the ins and outs of it, but there there was a review of this act. Um, it's not, it's it's sort of re signed every every couple of years and in that review like for the, the minister for justice they they kind of set out i suppose the current situation is an is an actual thing in this report by the minister for justice and it says it's june 2023 yeah and it's saying the activities of organized criminal gangs continue to present a significant challenge to the state and it's talking about these groups exert a malign influence on communities throughout the state and it's mm. specifically talking about murder, smuggling, uh, supplying drugs, money laundering and armed robbery. So really you're talking about these things to do. Tick four of the five. Yeah. So exactly. So we're going to see this. I mean, what what evidence is there that will be going to the DPP? Mm. Nobody, I think, believes you're going to have uh, pictures of CCTV of any of the, the three the three guys, the three Kenyan guys, you know, at a murder scene or, you know, I mean, we don't fingerprints on The Last time Christy Kinnan, like it will be unusual and it will be an extraordinary, um, it'll be the start of something I'd say that'll be more frequent in the future because like Christy Kinnan Sr. hasn't probably been in this country Oh, I mean, in a long time. I mean, it, over 10 years, I'm going to say. Yeah, I mean, even yeah, exactly. I mean, he was at times in, in during the t- 2010s or even earlier back for those Matthew Macklin fights, if you remember. But after that, he, he had, no, from 2014, he went back up to 2014, sorry, 2012 ish. He went back up to prison in Belgium yeah. and served out a sentence that he was wanted for there, uh, having lost an appeal. And I think then he moved briefly back down to the Costa before. Uh, migrating full time out to Dubai. Yeah, before before the sons even. Who were, before the sons, yeah, he yeah. was gone before them, and the sons they returned here for the funeral of David Byrne in February of 2016. They went back to Spain, but by May September of that year, they were gone. Yeah, with everything they yeah. had gone with um, their business. Mm-hmm. and they had gone to Dubai. There was nothing left, really, other than bits to be s- w- wiped up in the, the gym, the MGM gym, when it was raided in September of 2016. And that was when James Quinn, their childhood friend, was arrested, put on trial and found guilty of the murder of Gary Hutch. So none of them have been back in this country for a long time. No. So they're going on trial for activities um, and for... Crimes that they committed remotely, basically. Crimes that they committed remotely. And how can that be proven? Because although, you know, it'd be one thing to charge them, it has to then still go to the special criminal court. It it will go before three judges. But it's not a slam dunk. I mean, I know we've spoken about this before, how there's a high rate of conviction in the special criminal court. But they still have to be presented with evidence Yes, um, and it will be. It will form what will form part of the evidence will be the structure of the Kinahan organisation, yeah. um, which was laid out somewhat in when the during the sanctions and those uh, individuals that were named, including Johnny Morrissey, Bernard Clancy, Ian Dixon, all key members of the grouping. Sean McGovern, there's already a, a arrest warrant out for him for the murder of Noel Duck Egg Kerwin. He has remained free for a year and a half nearly since that um, yeah. arrest warrant was issued. Um, we, if the DPP, and by the way, it's all on the DPP. We're going to yep. go back to Drew Harris in a minute. Yeah, It's all on the DPP now to make the decision on whether or not to uh, take this, I suppose, almost, could you see it as a brave decision to bring them back, to put them on trial for crimes they committed when they, were no lo- when they weren't even in the country. Um, so, 
you know, if those decisions are made to br- to bring charges, then those arrest warrants will be issued for them, and the United Arab Emirates will be told that they're wanted yeah. to go in the, into the special criminal court. Just briefly dipping back to Drew Harris, if I can. Yeah. yeah. So, if you remember, Drew Harris is an interesting character. Yeah. I think, um, unpopular character, we didn't, and. We didn't s- the force. Within the force. And you can say that because you know that there's a, a vote of no confidence. Yep. Um, the GRA have uh, balloted their, are going to ballot their, have they done that? They're balloting their members. Yeah. Yeah. Drew Harris, maybe a year ago or thereabouts, gave a statement to the media in which he said that he did not know which country the Kinnahans were going to go to. Yeah. to face trial, but it was very unlikely it was Ireland. Yeah. And at the time when he said that, as head of the Garda Síochána, there was sort of a lot of eyebrow raising because since 2016, there has been an enormous amount of investigation gone into the Kinhans, an enormous amount of Garda resources gone into sort of untangling the structure, their money laundering, their wing, their drug importation wing. There has been a huge amount of uh, dismantling of the organisation here in this country and all to that aspiration of bringing back the leadership. Yeah. So when Drew Harris said that, if I had it to hand now, I should have actually brought it to hand to see when it was that he said that. I mean, he was pretty categorical they weren't coming home to this country. And you would wonder, was he actually aware of the work that had gone on and what was happening yeah. within his own force in relation to that. Because, of course, the Angarda Shikon is a public body yeah. funded by taxpayers' money and, you know, they are accountable for what they're doing. So that's what they have been doing. Yeah. Um, and we're now into 2023, so we're uh, seven years into that process yeah. now. What was hoped initially was going to be a five-year process, I think delayed somewhat by COVID and by other things, a bit like building work. It takes a little bit longer than anyone ever tells you as well. I mean, I think Drew Harris is, as you said, he's not necessarily popular with the, the rank and file members. He's coming from, obviously, from the PSNI, from a different police organisation. Former the, RUC, is he not? Former RUC, but also from a different culture of policing, I think. Um, like the PSNI are very, very different than the Gardaí, even to deal with as a journalist. Um, they're just, uh, you know, they've gone through... They've gone from the RUC to being the PSNI. They have a kind of a... Uh, Drew Harris is a quite accomplished uh, media performer, I think. Mm. I think that would be something that would have been particularly valued within the PSNI. He would have been a good at... The PSNI are much more uh, politically responsive, I suppose, and that there's, the, the you know, how they're structured. They're, they respond to the politicians in, in a different way. They're held accountable in a different way. Uh, they're cal- held accountable to kind of boards and, you know, cross-community political organisations. So I think he's more of a political animal. Yeah, I agree. Drew Harris, totally. do you think so? Um, yeah, I do. I, I don't think he's a great media personality. I th- did you see him on The Late Late Show? Well, I mean, that's... Well, I, I actually think he's quite good in the media for... You know the, the the average Joe Soap, if you know what I mean. Rather, you're looking at it. As I just think he's no personality, <laughs> or certainly <laughs> that's no personality. Comes but that, maybe that's not a bad thing. No, that could be a skill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're more of um, the uh, the old Donald Donald Trump sort of uh, media performer, as in he's entertaining. Yeah. Like he's not particularly entertaining. No, he's definitely not that. But, he, but he's more uh, capable of talking, you know, than some than some previous Garda commissioners who avoided the media l- like <laughs> I'm only joking no no <laughs> you know what I mean it's not like the old uh, there was you know the, there was a vehicle and spotted yeah. on the thing he's not like that like he's quite so but they're, they're, that said he's coming from a very different culture and I think um, I'll tell you what I think I think he's gone in there I, I mean he's, his, his tenure has been extended by two years which is extraordinary um, he's gone in there and initially when he came, there was, you know, he came out of the whole debacle with Noreen O'Sullivan, mm. who I think was unfairly treated as a commissioner. I think she was the first woman in the job. I think when you look at what happened with that tribunal, with the former press officer and everything else that happened, she went into a shit show. And I think she walked away from it and probably had to for her own reasons, probably personal reasons. I mean, there was only so much you could take. Um, 
there was areas of the guards where she wasn't popular, but I think it was one of those organisations that didn't really want change. What what organisation does want change? If it happens in here, we don't really like it. Sometimes it's for the better. Yeah. And, you know, you eventually get used to it, but nobody really wants change. But I think he was brought in and I think a really valid question that I'm still often asked is, what the hell did the RUC know? Yeah. I mean, what, what do they know better than the Garda Siakona? Like the RUC, the PSNI, the PSNI are a very different animal because they are not able to deal with the public in the same way the guards are able to deal with the public. I mean, the guards do have a very strong community base in this They do, country. but it's also, they also had a kind of an, an informality that was part of the Garda Siakona. I think that's part of Irishness, though. Well, we it do might like be, a little bit of informality. It might be, but there is also that... that that obviously ran into trouble, that yes. informality within the guard of Shia Khan, for example, in the, the penalty points, yes. thing, for example. So that that he's coming in from a very different culture. And he's, if is in Irish Times interview, he's speaking about uh, officers being suspended. Yeah. In the absence of proof of wrongdoing. But that is the way the PSNI operate. It's not the way the Gardaí operated, if you know what I mean. But is it, does that mean that we have to be the PSNI? I mean, the Gardaí Shikona, I don't understand that. I, I, I agree with people who raise that when they look to the Met. Yeah. Like what? I mean, they are probably one of the most corrupted police forces in the past few decades. Um I would, I'm going to say around Europe. I mean, they are, they have had so many scandals. And what is it that they have done so right? What is it that the PSNI or the RUC did so right that we, the Garda Shikona, have to go to them for change? I think, I don't necessarily think we had to look outside. I think it was because of a sort of a cluster that had happened around the time Noreen O'Sullivan was, was, was uh, I mean, she, she actually resigned, did she not? I don't think oh, she yeah. retired. Yeah. Or maybe she reti- retired... Apologies if you did. Yeah. I, th- I think there was a kind of a, I think she pulled out basically rather than um, than anything else. I think she kind of, I think she left her tenure early. But I suppose, I suppose not, the culture of, of the informal, informal culture was always going to come to an end within yeah. the Gardaí and... Well, we as a society wanted it to be... Accountable. Accountable. Yeah. And we got that in spades. And yeah. I think Drew Harris has brought that in. Yeah. To the force, to the wor- to the working of the force um, and for the public in a way that maybe is too much. It's like as if we had, we were here and now we're just gone completely. Well, you see, the so there, there is, I mean, that that's, you know, in the, in the, like that's part of Irish culture is an informality in all sorts of areas, not just to do with policing, even to do with our political system where you have, you know, TDs are allowed to write a letter on your behalf and get something done a bit quicker. We like I, to be driving a little bit fast. <laughs> but I mean, that is the way Ireland has been set up, is that, you know, there's people can have a word with somebody and get yeah. something done. Um, and that's part of, say, maybe Italian culture and some other countries. But it's not a part of all kind of cultures that, that want a very strict, de- you know, uh, you know, FOIing every yeah. request and stuff like that. So that's what he's brought in. The problem, I think, with Drew Harris in the, or the, these changes that have come in with the Gardaí is that the, the, the guys, say the detectives or the guys on the, the beat will say the consequence of that is bureaucracy. And mm-hmm. the consequence of that bureaucracy is in, in is that it eats up resources and that it takes up time, even that seeps all the way down to within mm. within the organisation. But people I think end up filling in a lot of forms do, and stuff yeah. like that. Now, whether that's like it's an avoidance, maybe in a way to go to certain crimes because they know the headache they're going to have, the amount of forms they have to, of the amount of people that are o- looking over their shoulder. There's that's what's said, come though, in that's is this Nicola, though, almost to, lack what? of trust. I think there's a feeling within the force that there's a lack of trust, that they are not being trusted to do the job that they're employed to do. And, you know, I think also when it comes to promotions, what's happened is there's this sort of a, a, a test which is doesn't suit everybody. No. But it suits some who maybe don't suit promotion. Yeah. But they will pass that with flying colours. Um, and yet others who would be probably fabulous managers of people don't seem to get past this structured 
yeah. test thing. Yes. Like, I, I think that, um, I don't know exactly what it's like to be working in the guards, but I know some really good people working in it who are fed up. All organisations, people get fed up every now and then. But uh, look, it's not just me and a couple of cronies of mine that are saying it. No. He is facing a, a vote of no confidence, which is a measure of how unpopular the guy is and how unpopular what he's brought in is. We have no idea whether he's what he's brought in is good or bad. We've no, we've, no we've we don't. We don't know. Against. I mean, you have to say, you know, it's come from the north. From and the, well, the other side of it is, is that, you know, it, it didn't come in for no reason. Like there is. Yeah. There is there was changes needed to be made. Now, like if you go back really historically, like and we're not going to go in, like not to go into the recent times, but like simultaneously with these things, you have stuff like the, the Kerry babies. Yeah. that's come out and like that's the consequence of having everything informal. Yeah. Like I'm not saying everything is perfect but you know yeah. that is the other thing that has happened within the Gardaí talking obviously a very long time ago and all yeah. that but that is the other bit of it that informality within things can lead to a type of corruption so going back to the matter at hand yes. because really we're not that interested Experts or even that uh, no in, yeah. in the I mean I'm constantly getting asked to do interviews you know to go on RTE to go on this that and the other about the guards and the problems they're having with their work practices I don't know no and neither do I I mean I just know anecdotally from people I do know who are working in that in the same way as I know people working in other industries mm. will complain about this I really don't understand the problem with the rosters and all the rest of it. Yeah. There's someone else to discuss and we're kind of going down a rabbit hole with it. <laughs> but the reason I brought it up was because Drew Harris said some years ago that there was no way basically the Kinnahans were coming back here, that it would be interesting to see where they went if they went to. And to me, that's somebody who doesn't understand the nuts and bolts of the crime bit of, of On Garda Shikona. He may understand the kind of the, what do we call it, the HR of how to run things, how to get papers the political, signed, as, the the political aspect, aspect of it. Of okay, we'll agree on we'll call yeah. it that, the political yeah. aspect of the job. But do, does he have any real understanding of the real aspect of the job, which is fighting at this point, you know, global, trans-global organised crime, as well as what's happening on the street level and within the, the you know, the Irish, within our own jurisdiction. Um, the fact of the matter is that at the same week that he has given this interview and he initially says that he can't discuss anything about the Kinnahan individuals yep. and then he turns around seems to be in the next breath and says but there's a file with the director of public prosecutions yeah in relation to them i mean that is just such a huge enormous breaking news story yeah uh when it comes to those who are interested in what's happening with the kinnahans because as i said we knew that was happening in the background but we were i think being fairly reasonable by the reason we didn't discuss it because we had some personal involvement in it and we agreed to not do it as a as a journalistic endeavor yeah. until the time is right or whatever. Um, the same week, Justin Kelly, who is the head of the Drugs and Organised Crime Bureau, has given an interview um, to the examiner and he's been a lot more measured in what he has to say uh, in relation to the Kinahan group. He has sort of towed the party line but Harris has come out with the big news, hasn't he? He's broken the big news because here he is, he's on top of his game, he's in charge of this? Well, I mean, I don't know uh, what his motivation are. Uh, look, I mean, he's done an interview with the Irish Times, mm. do you know? Um, I think you invited him on Crime World and he didn't come on that, I did didn't he? didn't actually invite you him did, on. You did, you did, during your anchor, one of your anchor chat rants. You okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was the other thing I wanted to say because he wasn't asked about EncroChat. He oversaw EncroChat. He oversaw the decisions that were made around EncroChat. He was the man at the very top of the tree and he rubber stamped what happened with that. And all that intel was kept for at least three years untouched. We're the only country who didn't pass that on to the ground level police who could do something with it and who could dismantle organised crime groups. Are you sick listening to me? Uh, well, I mean, I, I know I am in Nicola, <laughs> but I can imagine some people may be. No, um, so, but look, this is but how... it's a massive failing he's had in his tenure. Well, in my, beyond, in your, in, in my yeah. humble... But if you look at this interview with the Irish Times, like how do you speak to the political class in this country? 
Yeah. You speak to them through the Irish Times and you speak to them through Morning Ireland. Not Crime World. Not Crime World. Why not? Because you speak to the people. Our people are as... No, no, but you speak to the people. But yeah. the people, like, if you know yourself, mm. the TDs read the Irish Times. No, I know where you're coming from. On that and that is why yeah. he's it's speaking to the Irish Times mm. and that is why he's on the, fr- the front we think you say we're, we're interested in the Kinnans, but the public are interested in it. And that's why his interview is on the front page of the Irish Times. That is the section they picked out. And then inside they have the longer interview. So I think that is part of him speaking to the political cast, yeah. the opinion makers. And, you know, that's that's noted where it, it, you know, in his opinion, that's where it matters that it's noted, you know. But this has gone to the, the DPP. Well, that it's gone, the political class are taking note of him speaking out and, and getting on the front of the Irish Times and giving definitive line on the things that matter to the pub, to the political class, which are crime in Dublin city centre, which has caused a political storm for the party of law and order Fine Gael. So they have come under pressure because of the sense of the perception of lawlessness in the capital. The, is the is the city much worse than it's always been? I don't no. necessarily think so at all, but it's because it's made a lot of headlines. It affects Fine Gael, who are the, 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 mm. the biggest party in government, and they get onto the guards, and then the guards have to take action. Then Drew Harris does an interview in the Irish Times, and he puts out all of this stuff, and it's all a kind of a, a cycle of, of, of political and media management. He visited Store Street as well, yeah. along with... Um, um, the justice minister was back again, Helen McEntee, twice. Yeah, yeah. and see, this is that that shows you that that that's that is the way. So what you're telling me is we're the little people here. Well, we don't matter. Well, we don't matter to some people. We yeah. matter to other people. Yeah, but no, I'm not. And it's look. Uh, what I'm saying is that you know, I was actually did an interview with Robin Schiller, but it is like the the wire. Mm. You know, the media get a bit of a thing. It affects the ruling parties. They get on to the police. And then you get all this action. New extra guard hours. Loads of senior guard making themselves available for interviews with RTE and the the, the broadsheets. That eases the political pressure. Mm. And they, in order to do that, they have to give some juicy information, which includes... That's what I did. I mean, is that very cynical? No, I think that's pretty much it. I also think that, you know, he's doing it... Because he's realising he's in trouble himself, Drew Harris. Like, I mean, he says he's going to leave it up to the people to... I mean, he's facing, stepping down, which will be hugely embarrassing. I don't know if he did. did you well, I think he's... The, the I, no, but I think he said he's going to leave it up to them. He's going to see what they have to say and he's going to make his decision then. So, I mean, if he is... If there's a vote of no confidence against him by the entire... Well, the GRA. GRA the are the not... Entire a, force, you know, it's a kind of... the force. Yeah. Um... What's he going to do? Like, what do you do in that position if there's a vote of no confidence? Do you just carry on regardless? Well, I mean, it just no. <laughs> you could look at well. his cohort up in the north who uh, has hung on in there despite a couple of controversies. Yeah. Um, you know. But how do you, how do you ensure? The publishing uh, of the names of all the thing, the uh, PSNI officers, their ranks. Their but how do you ensure your survival? You ensure your survival by... Trump-esque. By no, you should no, you should ensure your he would ensure his survival by maintaining support within the government. Yeah, well, of course, you absolutely. Know, it, 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 yeah, it's like you know, if you were to, you know, you maintain your success in the Sunday World on the basis of your the people, you know, staying in with your bosses. Do I? Well, it's keeping with me now, and I'll keep. <laughs> you keep him with me, my dear. <laughs> But you know what I mean? Like slightly more complex in our situation. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but you know that's that that is the way his job is ensured because yeah. the GRA are not; they don't have a power to fire anybody. Yeah, no, that's I agree totally. So the, yeah. the minister for yeah. justice does. He's after doing a good job for the for the minister for justice this week in terms of publicity, mm. in terms of getting out there, getting his 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 uh, his other senior uh, assistant. Uh, Commissioners out there, including Angela Willis, who did interviews this week as well about crime in Dublin. Like that's what I think. Cynical, possibly. Mm. No, he has. I mean, he's he's definitely he's put them all out this yeah. week. But of course, he's the guy with the the big yeah. news. Yeah. Having everyone else been told not to say anything about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. It's not cheaty. 
Yeah, well, po- possi- possibly. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it did get on the front of the Irish Times. If he, if he had given bland statements about, you know, it's it, Dublin isn't that Which bad. the Irish Times wouldn't call him a cheater. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, look, let's get on to the more crime world Topic. interesting stuff here. And oh, Not the to political. Be, yeah. Thing. So the Kinnahans. Um, now, DPP will have to come back with this decision, which is going to be pretty soon. Yeah. And I can imagine, going to dip a little bit into the politics of that, for the commissioners to come out and to announce that it is putting a lot of pressure on the DPP to come back with something. It's all eyes on the DPP now and also on the speed of this. Um, yeah, because, I mean, let's let's look at it like, you know, what, what, what could they give them? Like, they're going to have to... I say the money laundering that you spoke about. Yes. I think that is going to be a huge role in it. Huge. Now, we don't have to be know what, have insider knowledge to know, for example, that the cab case involving the Mansfield and Bomber Kavanagh, we heard evidence already in court about how Daniel Kinnan was the true owner of a house in, 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 in County Dublin. Mm-hmm. So Cold that... Water Lakes, yes. So that, that, for example, is a typical bit of information that could be part of the picture for directing a criminal gang. It could certainly for be example. a criminal offence. So that's, that's yes. something that, that could be a criminal offence and that could feed into a bigger picture. So we're going to get, I think, a lot of that sort of movement of money and assets. I think that's going to be a huge part of it. Um, the yeah. electronic communications is is a mystery. Well, it is and it isn't. I mean, we've we've had little bits of that yeah. over the, the, the period of time and some of the kind of more high profile cases. Um, including that around Imre Arrakis, yes. the international hitman who was flown into Ireland by uh, Daniel Kinahan um, in a mission to kill James Mago Gately. Around the same time that Kinahan was getting married, of course, this was on his he- yeah. on his mind as he was planning all the celebrations in the Burj Al Arab. Uh, Imre Arrakis flew in. There was a network of people which were who were very inner circle, shall we say, of yep. both the Bomber Kavanagh and the Daniel Kinahan network, who were trusted to get this guy to Newry where he was going to shoot dead Mago Gately. And, of course, it all came undone because Imre Arrakis was being followed. There was cooperation between the Lithuanians and the Irish through Europol. And everybody was watching Imre because of different reasons and another crime he was suspected of being behind. Um, but the fact that he was flying in and out of Ireland became a worry because he was known as a hitman for hire, basically. And when he was caught in a cottage in Blakestown, he had a phone beside him and the officers who seized it managed to take screenshots of it before it disappeared remotely. And on that phone, there was communications with a um, knife was one of the handles on it and the other one was Bon. Bon something, yeah. Bon something, was it? Was it Bon mm. something? Anyway, um, knife, I believe, was Sean McGovern and the Bon handle was Daniel Kinahan, I believe. And they were directing that murder, uh, those two handles. Um, now, that wasn't on the Ankara chat network. It no. was a different network, which I believe is a network that the Kinnahans used, a sort of a private communications network that they used. Um, but undoubtedly, there was a lot of confidence there about the handles and who they uh, belonged to. Um, there's been a lot of work on technology is, and phone systems and communications, not only in Europe, but also here in Ireland. And that will form part of... And if you look at the, the amount of people that were convicted around Imre Arrakis, there was a good lot, a good lot of them. Loads of them. And they're all pled guilty. Yeah. So, as far as I remember, yeah, all of them pled guilty. So yeah. we didn't hear a lot of that evidence yeah. uh, about the communications, really. We heard bits of it in, 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 in the conviction, in the sentencing hearings. But there was obviously a lot more there. If the you ones that were kind of, I suppose, in cahoots, Imre, of course, pleaded not guilty and we did get information yep. from him. But Imre was also behind bars and he was communicating and asking, could he talk? Yeah. So there he is. was he was looking for a way out because he was going back yeah. to Lithuania yeah. to a murder charge. He was going to spend the rest of his life in prison. He was a man in his, well in his 60s. Yeah. Um, and he was looking to, do he certainly was looking to do a deal. He was looking to talk. Um I've no idea where all that went, but I know that he was. Well, there is other evidence there. Yeah. People pled guilty for a reason because they were presented with this is the evidence against you. They didn't yeah. plead guilty for no reason, if you know what I mean. Of course, they're usually um, bang to rights. Yeah, so we don't know exactly 
what's there. Electronic communications is definitely going to have to form a big part of it, mm. movements of money and, uh, you know, other things along those lines. I suppose let's get down to, and of course we're, we're kind of, um, you know, piggybacking the fact that we still have to get the Emirates to give them back. Yeah. And also the DPP has to uh, make the decision yeah. here. We're hoping for a po- one of the positive decision on this for the charges. But um, the logistics of getting them back and also how does the trial look? I mean, you know, we saw a show trial this year. We covered it when it was it was Jerry Hutch. I mean, all three Kinahans in the dock. You are talking a massive international story. You're talking one that will interest journalists from America. Absolutely. Across not. Europe, into Eastern Europe. I mean, this is the head, the leadership of the European super cartel, essentially. Um, and also the, the the sports links, all of that stuff course. will feed into the, the celebrity nature of the trial. Um, you know, the special criminal courts are very highly functioning, but they're small. They're small. I mean, um, it'll be it'll be it will be not to use an overused word, but it'll be unprecedented if it was to happen. Yeah. And um, the level of security as well. I mean, the, the, the Regency, there was a high level of security, a lot of armed officers there every day. It was still kind of, um, if we're talking about the Irish culture, there was still a touch of the Irishness around it, wasn't yeah. it? And though it was... Uh, well, everyone kind of got to know one another as well. And yeah, there's a and lot also of kind of, kind of a bit odd. And, you know, it, that bit of it, there was a bit of kind of informality, nonetheless, yeah. in it. I don't think it would be like that. No. Then, of course, the Ginnans as well have to be housed... Uh, on remand that one would imagine. Uh, They're actually housed within the prison system where they're already, a, you know, a grouping that have caused security issues and have had to be broken up within the prison system, which yeah. isn't huge, our prison system. No, and also that they will be held on remand first, which mm. is, you know, even more complicated because people have extra rights while on remand than they do um, uh, after sentencing, if, yeah. if they're found guilty, so in terms of access to lawyers, access to phone calls, all of that sort of stuff. So yeah, it would be, it would be, it would be, a, a, it would be a, a real challenge to the to the to the sort of logistics of the criminal justice system. And of course, I think as well. I mean, over the past few years, we've been very focused on the Netherlands and what's yeah. happened there, and you know, you know, in a way. Ridwin Taghi, the capturing of him in December 2019 was the beginning of another story of violence and tragedy for people mm. because of his very existence and because he was almost trapped in a cage and, you know, he was facing the laws of the land, which he ultimately rejects and, you know, as an individual and which he believes himself to be bigger than. I mean, we're looking at the same kind of personalities we're looking at with Christy Kinahan Sr., an extremely um, intelligent man, but also somebody who is, how will I describe him? I mean, he's into his conspiracy theories. He believes he knows how to trick people. I think ultimately at his heart, he's a fraudster yeah, and a very, very uh, clever, cunning one. Yeah, Daniel Kinahan is somebody who has proved that his violence and his bloodlust knows no bounds when he feels that he's been challenged or his power has been challenged. Um, Christopher Kinahan Jr. seems to be a bit of a non-entity in everything. He well, he's a bit of an enigma for us. I mean, yeah. And the other question the is... Today he could prove to be the most interesting <laughs> of all of them. Could, and the other thing is, I mean, we're thinking of them as, you know, all three. I mean, it's it must be three separate files to the DPP on each individual. I mean, that is the other thing, like, is can... can well, if it's for running the same criminal organisation, they would likely be tried together. It's unlikely they're going to have three separate trials. Well... You put them on trial together. If you look at the the uh, trial of the monk, yeah. I mean, the three facing the Regency Hotel. Well, they faced, in fairness... They faced different charges, yeah. but they were still... It was Part the one of the incident. organisation. the organisation and, and the kind of, I suppose, the carrying out of that organisational attack on... But again, okay. but again, that would have to be proven in each individual case as well as 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 an organisation. You know, merely the fact that they're related doesn't do. I it, think know. that I would be really surprised if they were facing three different. Trials. Oh no, I think they would. I be, think yeah. from the just the economics of it and the uh, that absolute massive mm. security. Uh, I mean. 
bear in mind as well in the Netherlands that his business partner and others have really strongly considered breaking them out of prison. They have yeah. had they've had kidnap plots. They have kind of it's been almost like the sting of the dying wasp with Ridwan Taghi. I think it took them over a year or more to get to get to grips with having him in prison and away from influencing what was going on the outside. I think that really took a long time. So while he was on remand or whatever the Dutch equivalent is, he managed to cause an awful lot of chaos until they managed to isolate him within the, the prison system, monitor who he was, he was in touch with. It took them ages. And yeah, he, the problem was ultimately the lawyers that he yeah. was using and one in particular who was carrying messages for him has yeah. been jailed in relation yeah. to that and convicted a relative of his yeah. and was carrying messages and directions to the outside. I also delved into this quite a lot with Jan Mayas, our colleague in uh, Amsterdam, and also with Saskia Bellman. And they have a great understanding of, of it and, and a great understanding of how he came from nowhere. Yeah. Taggy came as a street dealer. They didn't know much about him and all of a sudden he was massive. And I think from speaking to them, the bigger problem they had in the Netherlands more than anything was the fact that they hadn't dismantled the organisation yes. in the Netherlands before they brought home the head. He was jailed, but yet he had at one point, Jan suggested that he had up to 200 members active of his gang in yeah. a country pretty much, yeah. well, I mean, the Amsterdam would have similar population to Dublin. The, the Netherlands has a bigger population than us. But nonetheless, let's say we're like as like-ish. Um, the Kinahan organisation, on the other hand, here, while there's been criticism of the guards in the delay in bringing home the top command, they have dismantled what was on the ground here. They are not as powerful as they were. They will always be able to, with their money, their wealth, their influence, be able to call upon people to do things for them. But they don't have that same power base that they had when this all began no. in 2016. And I do think the Irish Prison Service have probably great experience, I'm sure, the Dutch have experience as well, but they have seemed to have in recent years, for example, with the Dundons, they've learned how to isolate them within the system, stop them getting power from behind bars. Uh, they just seem to have sort of nailed that down. I mean, where... But you, you know, know, like, we, we have to recognise that, I mean, all the systems and the prison system and those in command of the prison system, I think, have to recognise that this is... Again, unprecedented. We've never had such a powerful organisation, such a wealthy mafia mm. behind bars in this country. We've had, OK, terrorists like the IRA and the rest of it. And they were a wealthy, probably still are a wealthy yeah, I mean, they caused huge chaos within the prison system, obviously, mm. to the point of murdering innocent prison officers. So the prison s system had to learn to cope with them as well over yeah. in the 70s and the 80s, and which it did probably learn to cope with them but uh, it, it will be facing something similar. everybody will be facing something similar and you'd wonder in relation to the security around the special criminal court around the judges um, you know around everybody that's would you see the same would you see members of the public rattling into that oh, or would 100%. they be a little bit do you no, think no no 100% you yeah. would and again the stakes will be really really high because you're talking life sentences I mean that's yeah. the maximum um, and isn't it ironic to think, you know, how far they've gone and we've been talking recently of them, you know, looking at the likes of uh, Kish Island or Iran to settle in and maybe yeah. moving into territories in Afghanistan and various places like that. How far they've travelled the globe and yet they will ultimately be facing justice just across the road from where it all began, where they grew up, Oliver Bond. Yeah, and of course, just really, really even closer to where Christy Kinnahan was was raised in 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 Cabra, you know. Yeah, just down the just road. Just right from back to the, however, right back to the beginning, full circle. However, there's no charges yet, and there's no charges yet. Now we we yes, we're definitely we are jumping the gun a little bit, but uh, given that we have the Garda Commissioner Drew Harris to rely on <laughs> for this information, and we're not just relying on what we know ourselves, yeah. we're pretty confident that uh, full stop. This file is with the DPP. We know it's there a couple of months now at this stage, and. Um, 
it was finalised certainly in the last couple of months um, and this isn't going to be something, this will be given priority within the DPP's office. This isn't something that's going to go on a shelf no. and maybe be taken down and dusted off. Just to go into a little bit of um, maybe what the Assistant Commissioner Justin Kelly had to say because he's the guy now at the head of the Drugs and Organised Drugs and Organised Crime Bureau. That's what they're called, Jack? Yeah. Organised and Serious Crime. So Justin Kelly, um, funny enough, I remember him as a young guard, as a detective in the sort of Tala area, maybe he was working. Um, he would have been in Rathfarnham District Court uh, when I would have been covering that all those years ago. Um, nice guy. He's now gone in there in charge of that, you know, the um, he's in charge of that that bureau who are really responsible for a lot of the stuff we talk about. Yeah. That higher end policing of groups, the dismantling. And they've been the, the kind of the head at the head, neck and tail of this massive plan to dismantle the Kinahan organization. Now, previous to Assistant Commissioner Kelly, um, John O'Driscoll was in that position. He had an extension um, on his retirement before he left and he's only retired in the last year, I think. Um, but And he has a huge amount of uh, information on, on... Really, I think he probably oversaw that bureau um, at a time that it very much reached out to its foreign partners and had to become political. You talk about political. Yeah. yeah. Because that's what that area of the Gardaí had to become. It had to go out there into other cultures, into build, other communities, build those, build those relations and that trust. Um, which which Justin Kelly spoke about again yeah. this, this week. He spoke about how that has been an absolute transformation for the Guardian policing uh, international crime gangs operating in Ireland and said that they these days they can just pick up the phone and exchange information and that was just not a feature of what they what they were facing at the time. He spoke about the Kinnan organisation being at least partly dismantled. Um, he spoke about, but he also spoke about how uh, the rise of other other criminal gangs as well and, um, you know, how the, the, the Kinnan organisation might be largely dismantled, but it'd be naive to say that they're they're gone. Um, they're, they're, still, gone. they're still in business, basically, he yeah. said. Now, interesting, some other interesting stuff he said. Obviously, he wasn't given the nod to announce the <laughs> file to the DPP. So Which are not bitter about it, hope. Not bitter, no, no. Go on. Uh, but he talked about the Albanians, which is interesting because the Albanians are moving into the market in a big way. And I know some of the recent seizures, there has been some Albanian groupings behind that. Now, everybody's afraid of the Albanians across yeah, Europe. Yeah. Down in the Costa in Spain, certainly there's been a breakup of a lot of the groupings. They've moved away from certain areas because the Albanians come in very, yeah. very violent, um, hugely ambitious. Their MO is to move in, to undercut everybody else, deal directly with the Colombians and pretty much to take over the market. There are cell structures of Albanian groupings being set up here in Ireland, uh, in the UK, obviously, and across Europe. And they are the big, I mean, there was a report I was reading recently enough, maybe it was from 2019, 2020, one of the European monitoring groups. And they were talking about the Albanians being one of the biggest threats because they bring this sort of new level of violence, if we can say well, that. Well, yeah, I mean, the Albanian gangs, obviously. Um, yeah, though, I mean, I think in the UK it's been a significant uh, change in that they have sort of managed to control a part of the market and that exactly that, that they are, that they have become linked in with uh, some of the mafia gangs in Italy mm -hmm. um, and they're involved in organised crime at every single level. Uh drug importation, money laundering, and exactly so. The, the, we are seeing, like, the vacuum has been created in terms of the, the Kinnan cartel's, like, absolute iron cloud control of the whole drugs business. And, yeah, there's there's these gangs it's, are now no. moving in. And, we, I mean, let's let's be realistic. The level of seizures of drugs in this country are, is really, really high. Oh, my God. And Did you see what was seized in Spain this week? I think it was, was it a record of all time? A record of all time, something like almost 9,000 tonnes or something yeah. like this. I mean, the last record was 8,500 yeah. or something in 2018. This is like un 
unbelievable amount of drugs, amount of cocaine. Yeah. And Assistant Commissioner Kelly speaks about this insatiable appetite we have for cocaine in Ireland. Yeah. Um, and about the South American cartels sitting on huge stockpiles of the drug. So in other words, I mean, we ain't seen nothing yet. No, no. And I mean, it's, you know, there's seizure after seizure is occurring in this country, but it's not stopping. No. It's not stopping. And we've seen seizures from private airplanes, drugs being floated off the coast of Donegal, as well as, you know, the usual imports and airports. You know, we've had loads of seizures in Dublin Airport of people, sort of probably smaller scale smugglers trying to bring drugs in. It's going on in all sorts of ways in this country. And no matter how what, what they stop, it doesn't stop people trying to bring it in or it doesn't stop people buying it. Taking it, no, it certainly doesn't. 4.9 tonnes of cocaine this year under EU coordinated operations seized. And uh, international traffickers now using drones to transport cocaine off vessels and land them in destination countries. And that's ours. We have thousands and thousands of kilometres of coastline yeah. in Ireland. And going back to the beginning when this drug started to bob in on our seas, um, it's always been seen as one of the ways. We're actually very vulnerable here on the coast because if you draw a direct line mm. from... Um, South and Central America cross, you kind of hit Ireland and Spain, the, yeah. two, the two coasts. Um, and in the past, certainly going back to the 80s and the 90s, there was calls for EU help to police our yeah. coastline. Again, another political problem. Uh, who would we bring in to do that? And there's all the fishing rights and all the rest of it there. But anyway... Um, Cash seizures connected with cocaine are often nice, crisp notes, while those connected with heroin are often dirty and grubby. I'm not really laughing at that. I no. just think that, you know, to me, that actually says it all, doesn't it? It does. You know, the cocaine uh, has been paid for by people who've gone to the ATM and got out the new yeah. notes just to do that. Yeah. And the heroin is probably dirty and grubby money because they're begging for it on the streets. Yeah. And I mean, he, he, interestingly, actually, Justin Kelly addressed... Uh, you know, he addressed the idea of decriminalisation yeah. of drugs, which is the big debate around criminal justice, really, in this country and in maybe in other countries as well. But whether, you know, the drugs problem, which everybody accepts we have, which everybody accepts we're not solving with what we're doing, um, the debate about, you know, decriminalising, making personal, uh, you know, use of dr uh, personal possession of drugs, you know, not a criminal offence. That is the big debate, you know. And yeah. uh, he, he addressed that directly and said that he thinks there's, if that was to happen, there'd be risks to wider society, that you'd see a rise in open drug use on the streets. So that that was, a, that, I thought that was an interesting... This was the Portuguese model this of decriminalising the, model. the yeah. use of drugs. The use of personal drugs. Drug use. All drugs. Know? Well, um, uh, I'm not actually sure. Um, or just cannabis. Sorry, no, I don't. I think it's 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 not just cannabis. It's it's where personal possession. If you're caught with drugs, yeah, that are for your own personal use, which right. is obviously of a certain amount. Yeah. That rather than being treated as a criminal offence, that it's treated as a health issue. Issue. Yeah. And that you would be then uh, a, a given access to health services. You if look they at were in place. Well, if they, but this <laughs> is mean, the we other thing. Never I mean, work this here is, because we just don't have enough. But this is it. I mean, and this is you know, it's hard to argue that that if you go out in Talbot Street where we work, that you see people there, that those people should be hit constantly hit with charge after charge mm -hmm. if they're caught with a bit of uh, some drugs when it, clearly they need help, yeah, the medical issues. help, yeah. and that is the debate of decriminalisation. He's putting at the other side that that is not without consequences, and that he, in his perspective, you know that there, there, you know that there would be a surge of drug use, and there's the, the empirical evidence of that working is not there. Mm. Now, there's obviously very, very strong advocates um, who who have a completely different perspective, and that's another debate that's going through. There's commission on drug use that's going on. Yeah. So you know, yeah. It it. Yeah, look, it's 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 interesting times, is it? It is. I mean, look, I mean, what are we going to do if the Kinnahans come back here, all three? <sighs> I mean, we have an amazing trial. I can't think of anywhere better, really, for it to happen because it's really been, Ireland has been in the eye of the storm of that greed that was there and that made them become such powerful individuals in the global drug scale. I mean, you know, Ireland has punched above its weight when it comes to the use of drugs, but also 
you know, for yeah. our little country, but also for the global players that have been created. And I, I just think there's something about where the courts are located, the fact that justice would be meted out here in this country where, um, you know, you look at Oliver Bond, where the two Kinahan brothers were reared by their mother, where they played as children. And would they let their kids grow up there? Well, I mean, I suppose they didn't is the answer. But They didn't, but, yeah. it, it, I mean, it, you know, how would they feel if they hadn't have had this road, this route provided, I suppose, ultimately and firstly by their father into this sort of gilded world that they lived in? How would they feel about if they'd stayed put, try to make an honest living and rear their children? How would they feel about them walking past uh, crack dealers every morning on the way to school? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, uh, look, it it really is. Yeah, I don't know. I mm. mean, it's it's it, it's an amazing story, as I said before. And if you look at Rusty Kinnan, who grew up in Cabra, which is really fifteen minute walk from the, the CCJ. Yeah, he's also you know he went to school in O'Connell's where we've had uh, you know. A couple of Taoiseach went to school as well, didn't they? He had choices. Well, he, he went to O'Connell's, you know, I mean, I didn't... Now, I'm going to base my thing on memory, but didn't Gareth Fitzgerald go there? Or a couple of Taoiseach went there into that school. Probably, yeah. And um, people in my own family the went North there. Side. What? I don't know anything about the North But, you know, side. like, I mean, that yeah. that that is, you know, and yeah. I know certainly uh, one of the Chief Justices went there, as far as I know, mm. as well. Jim Sheridan went there. You know, produced many famous people, including Christa Kinnan. It Christa did, Kinnan. it did, it did. It was one of the most famous Christian brother schools yeah. um, in, in the city. So it's, a, you know, there's, there's Jim Sheridan probably would be a few years mm. older than him, the famous mm. film director. Um, so it just shows you, like, there's there's paths, all sorts of paths. Well, he certainly life. had choices. There's no doubt about it. Both his parents worked. He was supported. He was the only boy in a household. He was adored, loved. Yeah. He was academic. He was and other members of sport. his family really excelled in various oh, excelled. areas rather than get get into their, their 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 lives in particular. But so it's just it's it's undoubtedly it's there's he had that, and he did make choices. His sons grew up in the eye of that drug storm in the eighties. Yeah, in the nineties. Their own mother, a cleaning lady. And of Those course, the lure would say that she helped some of the heroin addicts and all the rest of it around there, but they were lured with the money, the greed, the that wealth drew them, and obviously, you know, personality as well. Yeah. Um, but they left behind their neighbourhood and their. I don't know how I'd feel if I went back to where I grew up as a child and it was like that, and I had said something that I had, you know, been part of that, that I had made it like that, that I decisions I'd made had created this toxic environment for children. And but maybe people don't view it like that. Maybe even Christy Kinnan Sr. views himself as obviously did by his own uh, speaking in court about being an addict himself, mm. of course. And maybe the sons look at it and say they were already the victims of the oh, I of think, addiction. I think they go with the age old thing that if they didn't do it, somebody else and would. There that's is some, exactly. Well, there is some truth in that, but I mean, that's not to, to yeah. defend everybody, you know, uh, but yeah. So look, but anyway, we'll we'll see. I mean, we could be realistically, we could be looking at next year. Um, you're very optimistic, I have to say. There, yeah, you're you're, no, you're, you're speaking I'm, as if it's happened. I think it's I think it's happening. The next, I think. The biggest barrier. Right, I think it's happening. I think the biggest barrier, the next one, is going to be the UAE. Can they refuse the uh, handing over of all of them with, with a, a significant charges? They've, Sean McGovern to the UAE is nobody. He's a nothing. He's just a lowly member of a big organisation. The Irish are going to be out there looking for the heads of the European super cartel. The heads. I think. I think the fact that they're already sa formally sanctioned by the American government will make yeah. it a lot harder for them not to be Absolutely. handed over. And I think that really must be part of that that whole strategy. The fact that they're there, it's public. Yeah, it's repeated every day. I saw 
some even just articles about Tyson Fury and on, and it always gets thrown in across the world and mm. I think that would make it very difficult for the UAE. Netflix have managed to ignore that the whole, the whole <laughs> yeah, yeah. connection. I know. Yeah. I've been watching little bits of it yeah. and uh, yeah, they've managed to do it at home with the, the Furies around the time of those sanctions and when of course Tyson Fury himself had difficulties getting into the States and hasn't been back since because he's on that list. Um, yeah, they've just kind of carried on regardless and ignored that. Well, they're on my shit list too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot. It's a long list. It, listen, it just gets longer every yeah. single day. <laughs> anyway, right. Uh, I'm going to go. So I'm yeah, gonna, you're on your holidays formally. Well, supposedly. Yeah. I'll uh, talk to you anyway. I'll be in touch. See what ails you next week. Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go home and I'm going to like spray myself with fake tan because I feel so white compared <laughs> to you. you. Look what you've done to me. Yeah. Look how orange you are. Well... Yeah. You look almost jaundiced. <laughs> yeah, definitely to Donald. Do you think it suits you? Well, I don't know. <laughs> you like it, do you? Look, it hides my grey hair, put it that way. Yeah, you see, you could actually just get the fake, slap the fake tan <laughs> on. Lots of men are using cosmetics and stuff. Did you know that? I did, I did, yeah. yeah. I did, I actually taught my daughter, I've been saying my daughter, she's using fake tan and it's only last week I discovered, no, that's actually foundation. Oh, <laughs> And why were you having a go at it? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no I was keeping it there for fake time. She said, that's foundation. Yeah, get with the programme. Yeah. Okay, look, I'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Nicola.